Now we have here with us an, in Mission Control uh, the lead increment scientist for Expedition 39 and 40, uh, Yuri Guinart uh, Ramirez, uh, who is again the lead scientist for these both expeditions. And uh, she's going to tell us a little a bit about what has been going on for Expedition 39 and what we can look forward to in Expedition 30. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Brandy. Uh, it's great to be here again talking about the science we're doing during increments 39 and 40. Uh, first of all, um, we had a very challenging first increment uh, with a lot of systems vehicle uh, issues that had to be dealt with, but we were still able to accomplish uh, great things uh, during increment 39. Um, one of the investigations that uh, was fairly new for us, so brand new for us, was uh, JAXA's uh, hybrid muscle training. Okay. And uh, we successfully completed that uh, investigation with uh, Commander Koichi Wakata uh, performing these uh, measurements. Uh, this investigation, as you can see, there's a, a picture there of the device. It's uh, a much smaller way of exercising. And when um, we take the knowledge that we're gaining from the ability to exercise uh, with a much smaller combination of equipment, it allows us to possibly expand uh, to future uh, planetary incursions with a much less uh, bulky equipment to have to carry around to maintain the health of our astronauts and our crew. So by using that uh, kind of patch on the elbow that we just saw, that, that lets the crew exercise? How does that work? Essentially, it's a um, electrical impulses are uh, delivered into the muscles, and uh, you have your eccentric and concentric, concentric muscles as you move in and out. Uh, in this case, they use uh, curls, uh, as a movement, and as a crew member is exercising with the curls, the electrical impulses are delivered into the muscle, and uh, they are taking measurements to see how well that preserves uh, and conditions the muscle. And we will have uh, our last um, data collection after the crew member comes home with their, their final post-flight BDC, as they call it, uh, for our collection down on the ground where they'll measure the bulk of the muscle and, and how well the strength uh, and the toning worked, and uh, we'll see if this was a successful um, endeavor to help us, you know, incursion more into more compact devices and ways to exercise. And this can be translated to uh, Earth applications uh, for a variety of, of uh, um, possibilities, like uh, folks that may be bedridden, that can't necessarily get out of bed and, and exercise. You might be able to uh, help apply some of these counter measurement. Um, devices to, to help prevent muscle loss uh, here on Earth if we can pathfind that um, for the future. So it's, it's exciting. Okay. So that's an example of one that's ending with Expedition 39 as it ends. Are, is that the case very often? Or is there a big changeover as one expedition ends and another begins? There certainly is. Um, there's a variety of, of disciplines, of course, that we research. Uh, in the human research category, um, we definitely have a very strong correlation to our crew members because we these experiments are essentially performed on the human body. Um, so you are tied to that crew member for that. So that that's marks a, bi uh, a big um, correlation to our human research footprint. There are other types of investigations that um, uh, are obviously facility driven and we have plant experiments and other microbiology experiments and crystal growth and, and so on that are not um, tied to, to the expedition. So switching a crew member um, it really isn't necessarily a direct impact uh, as much as with the human research. Well, how do you go about, um, I guess, uh, prioritizing experiments, planning around these changeovers and, uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, operational uh, things that come up? So we have um, a multilateral uh, forum uh, with the IRT, and this uh, continues. We, we work together uh, very, very uh, early on the process, uh, starting with the RPWG and putting together the complement. And as we get closer through the IRT multilaterally, we continue discussing the priorities for all the different partners and all the different investigations. Um, I can tell you this first increment um, has been challenging because we have to consider the human research aspects of, of an investigation. When the crew member comes home, that's our last opportunity to collect that data. And we have that window closing, if you would. Uh, and then we had SpaceX-3 overlapping with that, which had a lot of uh, time-critical investigations that delivered time-sensitive um, research that had to be done within a certain amount sure. of time. 
Um, so that's where we put together all these different um, constraints and make sure that we can meet um, everybody's timing needs. And, and of course, the balance to, to not um, forget about the other investigations that may be a little more flexible, but uh, they're still important nonetheless. Sure. Well, you mentioned hybrid training as one of the ones that went on during Expedition 39. What are some of the other new and exciting things that y'all that got started during this past expedition? We certainly had a, a very large complement uh, arriving with SpaceX 3, and uh, that uh, would take uh, quite a bit to go through all of them. Though it's, it's difficult to choose, but we did have um, uh, one exciting uh, investigation called T-Cell Act and Aging that came with uh, SpaceX 3. And this was a very quick uh, activation that had to happen after the arrival uh, of SpaceX 3. And this will help us understand better um, the immune uh, impacts on the on the body due to space flight. T-cell activation? T-cell act in aging. Act in aging. Well, and what, how, did, how does that work? Uh, essentially, they're looking at, um, it, folks Folks were started to notice a trend. Uh, you know, um, I think they looked back at some of the early space program um, flights and realized that close to 50% of the crew members that went on those Apollo missions had an infection developed either uh, during the flight or within a week after returning. So that got some folks um, interested in that aspect and they started to study and they realized that microgravity has an impact on your immune system as a whole. So they flew these particular T cells, uh, which are part of your immune system, uh, to try to understand a little bit better how does microgravity affect that function. And uh, we'll be looking forward to the results when SpaceX 3 comes back and see what we learned. Okay. Well, I know you've got some interesting stuff planned for Expedition 40 as well. I think um, Opals is maybe one of the ones we've heard about. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. Randy, switching gears to the external um, uh, side of the house, we have the International Space Station. is a is a great platform to observe uh, not only the cosmos and the and the universe, but also back at our planet. And and there's different kinds of investigations we have. Um, Opals was delivered uh, with SpaceX 3. And we've uh, initiated the checkout for that investigation, and we'll be looking forward to do the actual science uh, involved with it. In this case, uh, we are exploring um, to gain a little more understanding of communication via laser. So we'll be able to uh, transmit more data uh, rather than with traditional wa uh, radio waves through through the laser. It's optical communications, and this particular um, device, Opals will lock uh, when the space station is flying over the JPL, it will lock in. It's the uh, Jet Pulsion Laboratory, one of the NASA centers in, in California. Yes, thank you. Uh, it will lock in uh, communications with the Opals device, then that ground station will sync up and once it's locked, it will transmit data through the laser. It's very sci-fi. It sounds like a movie. It does, doesn't it? It's like, ooh, communication via laser. Lots uh, of fun stuff going on on board the space station. And actually, that reminds me, um, I think one of the other life sciences uh, experiments that's coming up is called Force Shoes. Is that right? Yes. That, I mean, that sounds interesting. I can think of a nickname or two. Um, yes, uh, Force Shoes. That, uh, interestingly enough, is uh, another human research investigation. And we have, uh, as mentioned, a lot of exercise devices on station to try to keep the crew conditioned and, and properly uh, preventing the, the muscle atrophy that happens during microgravity. The force shoes uh, is, is a device that will measure um, the dynamic loads as the crew member exercises. Uh, essentially, we had uh, an ARED, which is uh, one of the resistive exercise devices. Um, currently doesn't have the functionality uh, to working correctly to collect the data on okay. the force impacting. So with these force shoes, we should be able to collect the, the information uh, on, on the, the loads. Right here, where we would use those force shoes. Yes, that's Why right. Why is the load information important? Because it will help uh, the medical community and the research community understand how to better fine tune that exercise uh, protocol. So as you exercise, you are better uh, able to understand, do these more, th these exercises more, less of that kind, uh, and, and the forces will translate to help 
So you can kind of perfect exactly what you need them to do to stay healthy in space. Exactly, and okay. fine-tune that. And I could see applications in, uh, on Earth sure. for the same, uh, for the same uh, capability for us to, to fine-tune our workouts. So. All right. Well, I think we'll be uh, hearing a little bit more about that later in the week when we have another guest come speak with us. But before we go, any other um, uh, experiments that you'd particularly highlight? Well, we, um, we have uh, several happening, uh, as, as we mentioned, it's a very large complement profile. We did um, initiate uh, HDEV uh, recently also with uh, okay. SpaceX 3, and that will continue. That's high-definition viewing of the Earth. With that one got some attention. I think a lot of people were interested in that. I think it's, it's generated some interest uh, with the downlinks, and, and that's great to see the, the beauty of the planet being broadcast to the entire world uh, to be able to just click on it and, and look at it. That's, that is exciting. That is very, very exciting. Um, during increment 40, we'll continue with some of that. We uh, also have a lot of work uh, ahead with Robonaut, too. We have legs coming for the Robonaut. Right. Uh, so we'll be looking forward to uh, atta uh, increasing the capability by attaching the, the legs. Speaking of science fiction. Yeah. And going, <laughs> keeping with our science theme, uh, science fiction theme and uh, check out some of the mobility capabilities for Robonaut. Um, we'll have um, other investigations with uh, Orb2 arrival. Uh, we will continue our CubeSat deployers, okay. uh, NanoRack CubeSat deployers, where we bring a suite of satellites uh, to continue uh, exploring the, that capability. And uh, we're looking forward to Orb2 delivering a few. I think the image right now um, will showing the uh, Orb1 set of satellites. A deployment of one of the satellites there. So we're looking forward to more okay. more of those. Well, it sounds like there's lots to look forward to, and probably we'll be hearing more from you in the future. Thanks so much for joining us. Again, this is Yuri Gennart uh, Ramirez, who is the lead increment scientist for Expedition 39 and 40. And again, 39 wrapping up today with the uh, er, departure of the Soyuz TMA-11M with its crew member going back to Earth to uh, land in Kazakhstan this evening. That's all for now. We'll go back to our regular mission coverage. This is Mission Control Houston.